obviously somebody must have dropped the ball on this one big time. Yeah, the president. Uh, look, don't blame the staff. Blame the president. He has no real, he has a tin ear when it comes to the responsibilities of the presidency. Uh, his theory of, of leading is just to make lofty statements and hope everyone follows him. And when something like this, which is in essence an obligation of the job, comes along, uh, not only was he not there, but he didn't have Biden go. Uh, yeah, or, or for that matter, he didn't have Kerry go. He didn't even have Holder go, who was there. Uh, joining us now, the man himself, Governor John Sununu, former governor of New Hampshire, former White House chief of staff to President George H.W. Bush. Governor, happy new year to you. And, uh, you know, six years, right? This guy's been president, and uh, I guess he still doesn't get it. You know, it, it, it gets worse and worse instead of better and better. Um, the, the President Obama really has not grasped the responsibility of being president of the nation that has to lead the world. In fact, he almost is averse to the idea of American exceptionalism, uh, exceptionalism and, and the responsibility of being the last superpower. And to a great extent, um, he has eroded the credibility of the United States uh, to our allies and, frankly, um, made it so that even our, friend, uh, our friends not only don't respect us, our foes uh, don't fear us anymore. Yeah. And it's a terrible, terrible situation. Yeah. It's, it's why the world is as unstable as it is today. You know, Governor, uh, there was uh, talk about uh, passing legislation to prohibit the transfer of any more Gitmo pr prisoners uh, in the context of what's been going on. And again, in your face, if you don't like it, too darn bad, last night, it came across that he transferred five more of these prisoners, these thugs, uh, you know, some of them Yemen, Yemeni, uh, to a country right near Yemen, and you know they're going to wind up back there. What is, what's with him? It, it's, it's not just that they're going to wind up back in Yemeni, but, but the, the, the record on the, on the releases he's had is that almost half of them have showed up uh, back in, in uh, the battlefield, so to speak, doing harm to the United States and to the allies and friends of the United States. It just, it, it just really boggles the mind. And if you didn't know better, you'd come to some really nefarious conclusions because I just don't understand. Now, uh, you know, you, you could look at, uh, at, at uh, the fact that um, he didn't go to France and, and, and no, no high-ranking representative went to France, as you indicated. Uh, but, you know, it's beyond that, his, his, his reaction. Look, look what happened when the police officers were, were assassinated in yeah. Brooklyn. He still hasn't said boo about those police officers. His, his reaction to the, the terrorist attacks in France, would, you would have thought if you didn't know what he was talking about, it was no big deal. It was uh, something that uh, troubled, troublesome came up and he condemned it. But really nothing bad happened. Same with the rabbis who were slaughtered with the meat cleavers in the Jerusalem synagogue. You know, no, no outrage. I mean, it, it, he doesn't have it in him. It really um, has, it started that way, and it's ending up that way. And I think he's just going to take the last two years uh, and do constituency pandering. He's going he's to find the constituencies that supported him and find little things that, that uh, he can do to solidify his legacy with them. I mean, this, this issue of free community colleges, uh, talk about constituency pandering, um, I, it, it's First of all, it's unrealistic. Uh, it, it really can't be done uh, with, with the kind of economic situation the country's in. And yet he wants to throw it out there so he gets credit uh, amongst the young people, a lot of whom, unfortunately, were great supporters of his in 8 and 12. Let me ask you a question. How do we allow people to, to go to Syria, to go to Iraq, whatever, fight there, train there, and then how do we allow them to come back into this country? Well, that, I hope, uh, has gotten people scared enough that we're going to see some legislation dealing with that. And, and almost, I think it will probably be, be a piece of legislation that is sent to the president daring him to veto it. Yeah, well, they're going to send him other legislation uh, that he's already said he would uh, veto. What about, uh, what, what do you think the scenario is going to be uh, with this defunded uh, Homeland Security bill, defunding the executive order on immigration? Uh, will they get the 60 votes in the Senate to, uh, to take a vote on it? 
you know, I, I've been talking to people. Uh, they're not optimistic about it, but there are a couple of Democratic senators. They are a few Democratic senators. They are working on uh, to perhaps just vote to allow it to come to a vote, and then they don't have to vote on the bill. So they're they're working out. They're trying to figure out a way to do it. But you know, this is important for for folks to understand that that uh, I think we should take this legislation and keep driving this kind of legislation home. But un- until we get a, a supermajority in the Senate, up to 60, uh, we're going to have to keep settling for not necessarily the best piece of legislation. Right. But we ought to be nibbling away at these things and getting whatever we can get through the system so that when we've got the right numbers in the right places, uh, we can finish the rest of the job. And maybe if we get him to veto enough bills, he won't have enough ink left in the pen to sign executive orders. <laughs> Man, it's, uh, <laughs> it, it, you know, we're all counting days, right? I know, we're, I know. We should, actually, we should actually put up a, a, a counter on this show, uh, counting down the days. You're absolutely right. Governor, great to talk to you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Have a great day. You too. Take care. Bye-bye. All right, folks. Uh, very interesting conversation, as always with the governor. We'll be back with the Mullsburg panel after the break, but first, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was the leader of the civil rights movement in the 60s, whose famous words helped move the country closer to achieving equal rights for all. Let's take a look back with this hour's American Moment. January 15, 1929 was a chilly day in Atlanta, Georgia, when a family gathered to welcome into this world a new life, and with it, a new hope for America. Two years after his birth, his father Michael King changed his name to Martin Luther King and then changed his son's name to Martin Luther King Jr. Throughout his 39 years, he instilled in Americans a new spirit of justice and freedom based on equality instead of status and character instead of race. He waged a nonviolent war on racial segregation with appearances that radiated with an energy that transcended all races, all faiths, and people of all ages, with words that still resonate today. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. He spoke to us of his dreams and his beliefs that justice too long delayed is justice denied. You're watching An American Moment on Newsmax.